Hey everyone, welcome to Island ECC Church Online. A special hello to you wherever you are in Hong Kong or around the world. Yes, Jessica. Hey church, the Bible tells us that the church is not a physical building, but where the people of God is. And God clearly tells us that all that He wants from us is to worship Him in truth and spirit. So today, regardless of where you are, you might be at home, you might be in Hong Kong or anywhere on earth, it doesn't matter. We will come here to worship God together as a people of God. Now we understand and recognize that our world and our city are in really difficult times right now. And it's in these moments that we need to trust and we need to believe that God is sovereign. In fact, Paul teaches us in this in Romans 8, 28, when he writes, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And so as a church community, let's continue to trust and believe that God is sovereign, that he is working all of this out. And as a church, we're going to continue to seek His will and prayerfully navigate these difficult circumstances. So let's prepare our hearts and our minds and let's join our voices together to sing some songs in order to worship God together. Amen.
church, we're going to share a song with you now that is an original song that Jeff and I wrote. It's called Father of Light. And in the Bible, Isaiah it says that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And that's the spirit with which we wrote this song. Just this idea that if God is for you, nothing can come against you in the name of Jesus. And it says in the chorus, if the Father of light is for you, the dark won't stand a chance. When we get to the bridge, it says, fear the cross has conquered you. And this is just such a powerful truth that I feel like we all as a church need to cling on to right now. This idea that God is for us, that there is no weapon formed against us that will prosper, and that one of our greatest tools here on earth is our worship. And so I hope wherever you are, as you're joining in today, you just step into worship, declare these truths with us. Feel the cross has conquered 
Hey church, singing songs really help me to focus on God and allow my heart to be transformed. And I hope it does the same thing to you. As a church, we do not stop worshiping God on Sunday only. We continue to worship God during the week. We continue to serve Him and also serve the church. The fact that we are not meeting physically at 633 doesn't mean that we are not doing anything as a church. In fact, there are so many things happening. That's right, Albert. Our Kids Club is back online as well. They'll be live every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on their Kids Club channel, which you can find at their Island ECC Kids Club Facebook page. This month, they're learning about faith, which is all about trusting what you can see based off of what you can see. Now, each service for them will have worship, games, and Bible stories that are relevant for kids of each age group. Now, Island Youth is also going live. We'll be live at 11.30 a.m. after the service where we'll be discussing the sermon and answering those discussion questions together. We'll also be live every Wednesday, 2 to 4 p.m. You can find the links for those chats on our Island Youth Facebook page or Island Youth Instagram. And as for adults, we just started a Philippian class last Wednesday. You can join us this coming Wednesday. This is a three-week course. And after that, we also have a course that we call The Heart Sayings of Jesus. I'm sure we can learn a lot from this. Now, church, you may or may not know this, but there are only five days left of the Bold Faith shirt sale. So go to the website and buy a shirt maybe for yourself or to bless somebody else in our city. And remember, all the proceeds will go to support the Bold Faith campaign. Now, another way that you can be giving during this time is through our 10K 4HK campaign where we're asking all members of our community to prayerfully consider if they're able to give a portion or maybe all of their $10,000 that they received. A lot of us have already gotten it from the HK government or we're waiting to get it. Now we're asking you to donate it to Hope of the City, which is Island ECC's outreach arm where we care and we have compassion for those in our community. You can get all of the information for this on our website, but the money will go towards things like rent relief, uh, groceries, and educational opportunities. And for the rest of us, we can continue to support the church through online means. Just go to the app, there are information for you. You know, we as a church will continue to serve God even though we are not meeting physically right here. So please go to the app and you can continue to give. Yeah, and through the app, you can get more information about all of the things that we talked about during this host segment today. And you can also use it to take sermon notes because we're heading to the sermon next. So pull up the app, get the notes open as we move ahead in our Island Summer Movie Festival with Frozen 2. Now, talking about sermon, why don't we go to God to, together to ask Him to help us to prepare our hearts and our minds. Let's pray together. Father God, we are amazed by how much you love us. And we are so thankful that you give us your word, the Bible. Thank you for allowing us to worship you. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity that we can both worship you and to learn from your word. God, I pray that you will help us to humble us, to prepare our hearts so that we are not just listening to a talk, but to receive your word and to act on it so that our lives will be transformed and you will encourage us. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Hey, welcome church. Thanks for joining us for Church Online as we continue our series, Island Summer Movie Festival. Uh, I'm Eric, I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm just glad that you're here today. And you may be wondering, wow, how did you get so privileged a position to be able to teach in Frozen Two Week? Because I know that's what you're thinking. Well, to kind of shed light what happens behind the scenes here, we had a competitive Frozen karaoke competition between the pastors, and I, I narrowly came on top uh, past Pastor Rick. So I had the, the privilege of doing this. And luckily, um, all this time, I had secret training happening from my daughter. And so Eden, I just want to thank you so much for ending every night at our house with a frozen song. Little did I know you were God's plan for preparing me for this moment. So, so thank you for that. And honestly, talking about surprising plans, um, how about life, huh? When, when I think back even last year to, to 2019, there was so much uncertainty happening in, in our city and around the world. Uh, we didn't know what was happening. And we got to November 1st when Katie and I welcomed um, another boy into our family. And uh, he was born about 2 a.m., which I remember, because shortly after I welcomed him, they kicked me out until I could come back at lunch. So um, I needed to go play tennis then that same morning because I really believe in keeping your commitments. And that's what I teach our kids. But he was born on November 1st and his name uh, was Shiloh. And we named him Shiloh because that means peace. And we felt like that's what our city, that's what our world needs right now, an, an injection of peace. And so our prayer is that as he grew up, he would become a, a peacemaker, a, a beacon of peace wherever God brought him. Um, and he did that. He did that really, really well for four days. The three days in the hospital, and then the first day we came home. And, and that first night, he slept so long. It was so peaceful and serene in our house. In fact, he slept so long that Katie and I woke up panicked, and we had to wake him up to make sure everything was okay, but it was perfect. And then the next four months after that, it was nonstop crying um, in our house. He had colic, which meant there was something going on that we couldn't diagnose or cure or, or fix. And so we just had to do life with him for four months straight uh, of crying. And, and, and that was tough. So then when we came from 2019 into 2020, and our care group always gets together to talk about what are our resolutions? What do we want for this next year? We get together and we write them in a prayer journal and we, we pray for each other. And honestly, I'd always been really into resolutions because I love the idea that for 364 days, you can um, avoid common sense and, and healthy habits. And, and just when one new day comes, you can turn a new leaf and be like, yeah, I'm gonna change everything. So I had always been really into them until a few years ago and I just, I got kind of lazy with them. And so when our care group would get together, I would say, I don't know, my, my, my goal this year is to be less fat. Like not to run a marathon or hit a certain weight goal or to be able to exercise or achieve something, just to be less fat. I, I wanted to set the bar low so if I had failed up to December 31st, maybe I could squeeze out some pounds on that last day or just a few. Grams, And so that was really great till I realized uh, there's a family in our care group who has a big prayer wall at their home. So every time you go, you go over, it's beautiful, except you see the only thing you know about Eric is Eric be less fat. So that, that didn't work out. And so I thought, okay, when I get to this year and we met as a care group for 2020, what did I really want and desire? And um, I was thinking about it. And I was like, honestly, God, uh, what I want is just normalcy. Uh, I would love for just peace and, and a routine and uh, to be healthy. And well, that kind of bombed. And I'm sure that is with so many of your uh, New Year's resolutions as well. Um, we just didn't know what to expect. And so we wanna just ask the question since we're all in the same place of, what do we do when life is just long, when, when it doesn't stop or it doesn't change, when it keeps tripping us up, when 2020 is like the schoolyard bully who gives you a wedgie and he's just made things uncomfortable for us. He's, he's put us in a place where we're all just tense and we're asking, great, what, what do I do now? Um, hope you love that, that imagery. But we're all asking that question of what do I do when I feel stuck or directionless? What do I do when the worry or the what ifs that occupy my mind are, are paralyzing? And as, as Frozen prophetically put it, in 2020, we've all gone into the unknown. 
and very few of us are buying Olaf's fantasyful thoughts of, well, it's all gonna make sense when we get older. I think we're coming to the realization it just might not make sense. But before we dive into that story, I want us to dive into a story that is fundamental for who we are as a church, a story um, with words from Jesus in Matthew 6, some red letter words of Jesus talking to people that he loved that followed him, who were dealing with worry and anxiety and him trying to speak life and truth into them. And these verses, they capture the emotional moment of anxiety or uncertainty that so many of us are living in. So let's look at that together in Matthew 6. And let's look at God's heart as he's trying to explain how he cares for lesser things, how much he cares for lesser things in hopes of magnifying and helping us to know how he cares for greater things. So let's do Matthew 6 together. Jesus says to people he loves, he says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father, he, he feeds them. Are you not of more value than they are? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to span of his life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, the world's richest man, in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, well, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father, he knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, they will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, Jesus is describing, again, to a group of people he loves who, depending on your version, are, are stuck with worry or, or anxiety. Um, but he's teaching them, and he's saying, look, look at the birds. They don't have a savings or an investment account. Look at the lilies of the field and how they're clothed. They don't run to Zara for the next sale. But God takes care of them magnificently. And those are flowers and birds. And Jesus says, look at you. Your heavenly father, he knows what you need. He is gonna take care of you. So this is, this is way more than just first world problems in the first century. Um, Jesus himself is saying that the fears of tomorrow, the worries and anxieties that they're not yours to carry. They're not yours to plan out how they will be resolved. And it just seems like the people he was talking to, and maybe you can relate, were getting stuck. Their myopic view of their concerns were robbing them of the life that God intended them to live. They were being, you could say, frozen by their worry. You see what I did there? You, you can't buy transitions like that. So I want us to leave us in that moment with Jesus in the crowd and his concern for their concerns. And, and I want us to, to jump into a story here where we find a character that is in a similar place. So in case you don't have a four-year-old girl who is upset, because you didn't name her Elsa, and you haven't seen Frozen 2 yet, let me kind of set the stage for what's happening uh, for the scene that we're gonna enter. And, and what you basically need to know is that Frozen and Frozen 2 is about two sisters. Um, Elsa, who's the older one, and she's the queen, and Anna. And they live and, and rule in the kingdom of Arendelle. And because their family rules this kingdom, they love it and they care for it, they have a responsibility to take care of it and its people. But as we come into Frozen 2, the kingdom of Arendelle has lost its peace and its stability, everything that it's known and its prosperity for years. And people, the people of Arendelle have had to flee for safety. And so it's at this moment where, where Elsa and Anna are called into the unknown on a dangerous journey. And they're going to find out that there is a dark side of Arendelle's past, a wrong that they have to make right. And they don't know where the journey is going to lead them, but they hope to discover the truth and to save their kingdom. So 
the scene we're going to jump into, or we would if we were together, and I'll, I'll kind of describe to you um, and kind of set that scene, is uh, it's a song, of course, because it's Disney. And it's at a spot where Anna is at her lowest. Um, the motto that she adopts, the name of the song, The Next Right Thing, um, is, is great and is really helpful, albeit it, it comes from a troll. Um, but she is caught in a moment of loss. She has lost seemingly um, things and people who were closest to her. Her world has crumbled. And singing and saying and thinking about the why saying of the next right thing was her attempt to cope with and deal with the question of what do I do when I don't know what to do? And, and we've all been there. And in fact, in case you're thinking an, an animated film is completely disconnected from real life, the actress who voices Anna, Kristen Bell, um, as, you, as you read some interviews by her, you find that this was um, an important moment for her as she wrestled with this narrative, the script, and what Anna was going through. Um, because she felt that Anna's development through grief and resolve gave voice to the depression that she had been feeling. And so she watched this character navigate that tough journey. She herself was able to navigate that journey too. So sometimes, even in an animated film, feeling the emotion or hearing the attempt of someone else trying to articulate what they're going through, their struggle, it connects with you. And seeing someone else allows us to get outside of our own world and see things anew and afresh. And really, that's the beauty of art. That's, um, that's what film, that's what music, that's what painting, um, that's what poetry does. It is, it's a laboratory of perspective and thought and, and struggle that allows us as a participant to, to watch someone else wrestle with the tough things of life. And so um, I really think this is an amazing um, song and moment where we get to also wrestle with maybe stuff that we're going through. So the song is The Next Right Thing. After service, we'll provide you the link. You can go watch it on YouTube and, and belt it out and, and sing aloud. And I know you're asking, Eric, well, you won the karaoke championship. Aren't, aren't you going to sing it to us too? And I, I would just say to you, I'm, I'm wise enough to go out on top. So I'm just going to read some of the lyrics that capture her journey for you. And so this is Anna in The Next Right Thing. She says this, I've seen dark before, but not like this. This is cold. This is empty. This is numb. The life I knew is over, the lights are out. Hello, darkness, I'm ready to succumb. So you're capturing the overwhelming feeling of grief and hopelessness that she's carrying. But as you see um, her in this process, here's where she starts to come by the end of the song. She says, okay, I won't look too far ahead. It's too much for me to take, but break it down to this next breath, this next step, this next choice is one that I can make. So I'll walk through this night, stumbling blindly toward the light and do the next right thing. And with the dawn, what comes next? When it's clear that everything will never be the same again, then I'll make the choice to hear that voice and do the next right thing. And so none of us, none of us are immune to this moment. It's such a great song that captures the stuckness, if that's a word, that we all feel sometimes, whether it's a beloved animated character, whether it's the real life actress who voices her. All of us have a place in our, in our present moment or our past that we can go to where we have felt that before. And in fact, it's a rephrased, maybe a redeemed expression um, of this motto that has been my guiding light for the last 15 years. Um, it wasn't from a troll, albeit my professor was old, but he said this to me and it stuck with me. He said, we need to be focused on the next faithful step, the next faithful step. And so if I ever get a tattoo, maybe that's what it will be, of course, in some other language, because it's much cooler, but next faithful step. Next, as in what is in front of me? Who is in front of me if I'm being present? Or what, what is inside me if I'm being present with myself and what's going on? Faithful. What is in alignment with what God is calling me to or who he is calling me to be? And step, to take action. That fear is not my master, that I haven't been given a spirit of fear or timidity. So before we circle back to Matthew 6, 
let me show you a verse that I have found that perfectly illustrates this concept of, of how God leads us. And it's found in Psalm 119, one of the most amazing chapters in the Bible. Psalm 119, 105 says this, that your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And so hidden in this imagery is, is, is rich meaning and context to how God relates to us. So if you would allow me, I'd love to show you for just a second what that is like. In ancient Israel, travelers who were traveling by night, they used to carry a small lamp like this. It would be a bowl and it would have a small opening at the end that would support the wick. And as you notice, their lamp may have been a little bigger than this, but it was only enough light to, to light up their surroundings, to let them know what is the next step or, or two steps ahead. It was never enough to open up their whole path forward. And this is, this is a beautiful imagery for us for how we're meant to listen to God and walk with God, uh, dependent on each step. But it's also a tough reality because most of us don't want a little lamp that does the next step or two. We want a floodlight that reveals everything. What are the hurdles that are gonna be coming up in weeks for us? That's what we really want. We want a God who is a fortune teller, who tells us the future. Um, but that's not really God's plan for us. That may be our plan, but it's not his plan to reveal the whole future because knowing the future never really changed anyone. And changing people is God's plan, that we would be transformed to be more and more like his character traits, and we would live that out in, in the natural way of who we are. See, in, in the kingdom of God, transformation is way more important than information. And to some, taking one step at a time, depending on God, may seem like a weak, frail way forward, but it's not. It's the biblical imagery of strength. When, when the Israelites were led out of Egypt, they had to depend on God for direction and destination, Every day when they woke up for manna, they had to depend on him that it would be there the next day. And after 40 years of wandering in the desert, when they finally made it to the promised land, there was an obstacle in front of them that they were told they need to cross. But the Jordan River was at flood stage. And what did the leaders do, the priests who were at the front? They had learned through wandering in the desert that they could trust God and they had to one faithful step at a time. And so as they stepped into the flooding river, and not until then did the waters recede and the nation was welcomed into the promises that God had for them. Even in the New Testament, the way Paul lived is the way he, he stopped, he listened to the Spirit, and then he took a step. He's responsible for the spread of the gospel and churches and is the reason we have so many of the New Testament letters that we do. One faithful step at a time is the biblical imagery of strength because we are drawing on the strength of God instead of depending on our own. And now this is beautiful, but it's also really hard from us, for us. And so let's go back to the light, not, not only physically, but symbolically and, and expose why this can be so hard for us. Now, why this matters so much and, and why this is hard is because the thing we instinctively want to do when we're stuck or we're down is usually the thing preventing us from moving forward. So when you're stuck in the past and you're dwelling on disappointment or maybe people who have failed you, um, the, the one thing you can't do is it's really hard to think about the future and have hope for that, but that's what will help move you forward. When you're in a struggle or you're in a fight with someone, the thing that will help you move forward to reconciliation is talking with them. But usually the last thing that you wanna do is to talk with the person that you're mad at. And if you ever find yourself in life wanting to be less fat, the thing you naturally wanna do is to keep watching Netflix, not get out of bed. Um, but the thing you need to do is to choose a healthy eating plan and to work out and to turn off Netflix. But, and so you're, you're just kind of torn all the time. The thing that you instinctively wanna do when you're at your low spot is usually not the healthy choice for you. And we can honestly, we can be our own worst enemy sometimes. We all at different points in our life, we, we play God and we're not even a good God to ourselves. I mean, forget all the people and circumstances that had, have led to your life circumstances that you don't like. Um, forget that when I play God, I routinely fail to do what is good for me. And I think that you might find the same thing. 
And this is why trust in a real God, having a connection and listening to be able to take that next faithful step is so important. Because as we allow God to lead one faithful step at a time, we can trust that he is leading us to what is best. We can trust that he can accurately see outside of our circumstances in our own little kingdoms and bring the healthiest perspectives and the best next steps possible for us. And here's, here's what I've taken as we circle back to, to Matthew 6 in verse 32. Here's what I've taken. Your heavenly Father knows what you need. Jesus' exact words. He knows you and he knows what you need. And God is not like us. He's not 50-50 on his follow-through or on whether what he's actually leading to us is good. He is the definition of consistency, of reliable, of faithful, of good, of just. And so imagine this God is with you when you're stuck, when you're in your valley at your lowest spot, when you feel hopeless or helpless. And that is good news, isn't it? That that God is with you. And to be honest, God is not scared of the valley like we are. Remember, his goal is not revelation of the future, but transformation in the present. And, and these moments when we're at our lowest are ripe with transformational potential as long as we keep taking the next faithful step. And I say that because it's in these moments where it's so easy to bail out on the transformation. Our, our proclivity for self-protection will always outweigh um, our preference to go through the hard process of being transformed by God. And that is why, that is why when we go at 32, we have to continue on to verse 33, where God says, and the verse, if you're part of Island that you know really well by this point, is that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, Jesus told his hearers this, and he tells us this, because we will always protect our own kingdom first. He says, seek first the kingdom of God, because he knows it's, it's, it's part of the curse where we look out for ourselves and our world first. And in a sense, as you watch Frozen and you catch Anna's moment of time where she is at her lowest, she's left with a choice not of her own doing, but her own kingdom has crumbled and she has lost so much. And the thing that compels her to do the next right thing is thinking of a kingdom that is greater than her own. And that's not easy. It's not easy to be able to let go of your own kingdom as number one. What you thought your future should look like, where you feel like this relationship should be at, at this point, where your financial stability should be at because of how hard you have worked. And so your next faithful step, honestly, and you need to be honest, it may be your hardest one, but it's without a doubt the most important one. Your next faithful step, wherever, whatever season you find yourself in, it may be the hardest step to take, but is the most important one that you will take. And so here's what I wanna kinda of do to, to close up, is I want, I want us to think about ourselves and where we find ourselves, and then I want us to turn and think about someone else. So when you're feeling stuck, when you're feeling um, kind of helpless or directionless, here's a question that I, I want you to ask. What does it mean for me to be faithful in this moment? What does it mean, that next faithful step, what does it mean for me to be faithful? What does it mean for me to be a faithful father in this moment? How about a faithful employee when, when um, other employees are doing this? What does it mean to be faithful to integrity that God has called me to when other people aren't being like that? What does it mean in this moment for, be, for me to be faithful to the purity that God has called me to? What about being faithful to truth? Maybe that's where your battle is at. What does it mean to be faithful with the truth that God is here with me and that I'm not alone? What does it mean to be faithful for the truth that God is for me and my situation is not some punishment for God for something that I did? What does it mean to be faithful to the truth that God is not done with me, that if I'm still breathing, I'm still here, he has a purpose for my life. There is something that he wants to accomplish. And I want to, I want to give us an out in this moment from where we normally are and the way we normally think. A lot of us normally think, we think about better 
when we think about our roles. What is my role as a colleague, as an employee, as a husband, as a friend, as a grandfather? Wh whatever your role that you're thinking of, we often think, okay, I need to be a better husband, a better friend, a better, a better colleague, a better whatever. But if we're honest, when we're at moments where we're at our lowest, when we're just struggling to take that next step and struggling to go when we, when we feel defeated, that can kind of be self-defeating to think about being a better because it's so far in the future, it's so far from where you found yourself that it really gives the enemy sometimes a foothold to make you just feel horrible about yourself and you take no action. So in that moment, in this season, I wanna give you permission not to think I need to be a better fill in the blank. Because better, better is um, helpful, but you just need to bring whatever you have to the table, whatever you have in this moment, bring it to the table and you may not be able to be better now, that may be the truth, but you can always be faithful now. You may not be able to be a better right now, but you can always be faithful in the present moment. And that's what I wanna encourage you to do. Better is great, but faithful is best. And so that's where I want our hearts to be at and to be focused on. And I, what I also don't want to happen is to think, well, you know, I, I could see where if this person who heads their company or they who had their family or this person who's important, if I could see the consequences of, if they don't take the next faithful step, this could be all the fallout. But me, I'm a nobody. I'm just an average person or I'm, I'm down on the, on the totem pole. And so what's, what's the big deal if I don't take the next faithful step? But I, I don't want you to think that any one or any next step is insignificant because the level God uses your faithfulness to bring about his good, his change, his blessing is in no way proportionate to your perceived level of influence. But let, let me say that again, that what, whatever you think your level of influence is, the impact that you have on this world, whatever you think that is, is not equal to the amount, the significant impact that God can use one faithful step. That is the biblical narrative. It is not equal. God uses the smallest steps of faithfulness to do incredible things. And so that's why faithful is such a great perspective to have because it says brings, bring what you are, who you are in this moment and just take the next right step and trust God with that. And so here's the other thing. I wanna encourage you to think about someone else. I think it would be amazing as a church if we woke up tomorrow morning and we all said, God, who could I help take the, their next faithful step? Because uh, the truth is everyone is facing battles that we know nothing of. And a lot of us have had the privilege to see those who are in, in deep poverty or who have extensive wealth, who are young or who are old, or who seem to have their act together or who apparently don't have their act together. We, we've, if you've lived long enough, been able to see behind the scenes and you see no matter who you are, where you are, what you have, we all have struggles in our life that we face that are legitimate. And so it would be amazing blessing if we woke up and we said, God, okay, help me to be faithful in my next step today. But also, who might you put on my mind that I could help pick up or support or encourage or help resource for their next faithful step? I think that would be a beautiful, small step of healing in our city and in our church and beyond. So I wanna encourage you to do that. Think about yourself, but also think about someone else. Um, and I, I wanna close with this. Years ago, uh, Elizabeth Elliot, uh, she wrote a book um, closer to the end of her life that was both about being Christian and, and being a family. And it was about the blessedness of simply doing the next thing. It was something that her mother had read to her growing up. There was this, this, this poem in there that her mother had read to her as she was a young girl and it had stuck with her. And Elizabeth's story is why I wanna read this piece of poetry to end. So I need you to know her story to understand why this is so rich. That at age 30, Elizabeth was a missionary in, in Ecuador. And her husband was killed by the Aka tribe who him and some other friends were trying to reach with the love of Jesus. There was a misunderstanding of why they were there and they were speared and they were murdered. And she was left at that point with a 10 month old girl. She's 30 years old and she had a choice to make. Some were claiming that the deaths that her husband and these other men faced, they were senseless, they were useless, they were a waste of life. 
And honestly, if Elizabeth's kingdom, her kingdom was her only kingdom, she probably would have mailed it in and then headed back home, but she didn't. Instead, she took the next faithful step and she stayed the course living with a neighboring tribe. A tribe. She had no idea that God would bring two Aka women from that tribe into the tribe she was living and that they could help build a bridge into that tribe. And that years later, after her husband's death, she would be able to go and to meet with the tribe, tribe to live with them and to share the love of Jesus with them, to see a spiritual transformation and awakening happening in that community. And it was all because she just kept taking the next faithful step. Near the end of her life in interviews, people would ask her, what, what allowed you to have the experiences you did and do the amazing things you did? And she put it simply, she says, the main thing that I've learned in my life is that you have to trust Jesus. And so in this book where she shares this piece of poetry, um, the reason it has depth is because she was reflecting on what influenced me to be able to do the things for God that I did to get through those hard times. And she reflected back on this poem from her mother. And she thought, this is what the message I wanna pass on to my next generation. So let me read that with you now. And um, I pray that you will be blessed. It says this, from an old English parsonage down by the sea, there came in the twilight a message to me. Its quaint Saxon legend, deeply engraven, hath, it seems to me, teaching from heaven. And on through the doors, the quiet words ring, like a low inspiration, do the next thing. Many a questioning and many a fear, many a doubt had its quieting here. Moment by moment, let down from heaven, time, opportunity, and guidance are given. Fear not tomorrow's child of the king. Trust them with Jesus and just do the next thing. Do it immediately and do it with prayer. Do it reliantly, casting all care. Do it with reverence as you trace his hand who placed it before thee with earnest command. Stayed on omnipotence, safe beneath his wing. Leave all results and just do the next thing. Looking for Jesus, ever serener, working or suffering, be thy demeanor. In his dear presence, the rest of his calm, the light of his countenance, be thy psalm. Strong in his faithfulness, praise and sing. Then, as he beckons thee, do the next thing. Church, let's pray. God, I thank you that in a world that is ever-changing, that is confusing, um, that is hard just to have stability in, I thank you that you have given us a perspective and a way forward that is doable, that we are called to show up with what we have and who we are, to ask you, what are you showing us, and just take that next step. That God, it's such a ease on my heart that I don't have to know what are 30 steps from now, but true trust and dependence on you is just, it's just taking that next step. So God, that is not natural. And I ask for everyone listening now that you would do the supernatural in growing our trust for you, growing our childlike dependence and trust to say, if that's what you say, God, that's what I'm doing. I'm gonna trust you. And we pray that you will get the glory from that, you will be blessed, and we will experience more and more peace and confidence as we walk with you in this manner. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
fixed upon it, Mount of God's unchanging love. Amen. One thing I learned from this sermon is how God relates to us. God may not reveal everything in the future to us, but because He is a safe God, we can trust Him. When we take our first step, God will reveal to us the next one. He is such a faithful God. Now, as a church, we're going to continue to take faithful steps. So if you'd like to partner with us in what we're doing, then we'd love for you to join us by giving online through our church app. And remember, when you go to the app, you can get all the information you need. Classes, activities, and how you may support the 10K for Hong Kong. Reflection questions are going on the screen after this message. So if you'd like to discuss those with your friends, your family, your care group, we'd highly encourage that. Now next week, we're going to continue on in our Island Summer Movie Festival with the movie The Blind Side. So we'll see you next week at Church Online. Stay healthy and stay safe. God bless you. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye.